regular party out there. You guys are looking good. We're going to read Psalm 20 this morning. It's just after Psalm 19. Page 400 in your Pew Bible. Just waiting for you, Jeff. (laughs) May Yahweh answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. Selah. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May Yahweh fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that Yahweh saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of Yahweh, our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Yahweh, may the king answer us in the day we call. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, musicians. And good morning. And it is good to see your faces. And uh, just want to extend an invitation to uh, a video series we are going to be beginning this evening, uh, starting tonight, 6 p.m., a series that's been put out uh, beginning in 2018. And uh, they're adding to it again this year, but it is American Gospel. And uh, it's in response to, it's a follow-up really to the study that we've been doing in, in Peter on, on the, the focus on some of the false teachings in the last days. And a number of you have, have asked me, well, what are some of the false teachings or teachers we should be watching for? I've given some names but uh, a number of you have just said we're not familiar with it. And so uh, the videos that we're going to be running will be a series of six videos starting tonight, and it will be uh, looking at what are some of the false teachings, uh, as well as those that are are teaching these false messages, and uh, what does the Bible say is the truth. So it's a really well done documentary style uh, series, so I invite you to come and participate in that with us tonight. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus speaking of the last days, he said, There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Are there any of you who are experiencing that uh, fear uh, of the expectation of things coming? Uh, we're going to look at what uh, the closing verses of 2 Peter chapter 3 have to say to that today. And as we conclude today our study of 2 Peter, and I trust that it has been timely, that it has been relevant and valuable for, for each of you who've been able to take part in it. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you that there is a solid rock that we can stand upon and cling to. And Lord, I thank you that you are that rock and not only do we cling to you, but you cling to us. You hold us securely in the palm of your hand. And your word says there is nothing, there is no one who can pluck us out. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you that as we see this world falling apart, we do not despair for we realize this is not our world. This is not our home. We are citizens of your kingdom, citizens of heaven. And, and Lord, we look for the day that you are coming to take us to be with you and for the day when we return together with you to establish your kingdom here on this earth. I pray that you would give us encouragement from your word, that you would build our faith, that you would give us those things that we need to fix our eyes on, that we might not be shaken. Lord, I ask for that anointing of your spirit. I pray that you would speak through me, through your word this morning. Give us all hearts to receive. And Lord, I pray that as we go out from here, that we would uh, go with good news to a world that is increasingly in fear of what lies around the corner. Lord, I thank you that we do not need to fear, for you hold us and you hold the future. You are working out a plan, and everything we see going on around us as we look at Scripture is according to schedule. It is according to plan. And we take confidence and comfort in that. And so may your will be done this morning among us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, this portion of Peter that we're going to be looking at this morning gives assurance that as you look at things unfolding in the world and you anticipate what may be coming in the future, you can have absolute peace. That is God's intention and desire for his children. And we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. This is where we left off last week. First, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, or watching for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. It's him who makes us without spot, it's him who makes us blameless, and it's him who gives us peace. We, the beloved children of God, who are citizens of his kingdom, are supposed to be looking forward, supposed to be watching with anticipation, waiting for the return of Jesus Christ and for his righteous judgment against the wicked, this means that we are trusting and expecting the, the prophecies of Scripture to be fulfilled. And with the Scripture in our hand, we look at what's going on in the world around us, and we look forward with anticipation and with a peaceful confidence that He is coming and He is going to fulfill all the glorious promises that He has given to us in His Word. To be looking forward to or to be waiting for these things is the same idea that Jesus repeatedly expressed calling his disciples to be watching for his imminent return. Look with me in Mark chapter uh, 13 where we have Jesus instructing his disciples to be uh, looking forward to these things, watching for these things. And as we see the war unfolding in the Ukraine, as we see uh, the developments in our own country uh, stripping away freedoms, as we look at country after country after country all around the world and we see similar uh, decline, similar corruption, similar uh, decay, we see that something is going on. And Jesus speaks to that. Mark 13, verse 32, he says, But of that day and hour, uh, the day and hour when he's going to be coming in judgment, he says, No one knows, 
Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 33, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each, of his, and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore. This is what Peter is instructing us to be doing, to be looking forward, watching. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And so, back in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, the second part of verse 14 says that we are to be diligent, diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. In the original Greek, the wording of this, this phrase, be diligent to be found by him, implies that, that uh, we must give an accounting to someone. We must give an accounting to him. We have an accountability to him when he comes, and he is looking for something in us when he comes. He's not just coming and... Whoever is, whoever's ready, whatever. No, he's, he's coming looking for something in us. There's intentionality. And he's expecting us to be ready when he arrives. One of the things that Jesus is looking for us when he comes is peace. Jesus is coming in perilous times, the Bible tells us. When evil men and imposters are growing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, according to 2 Timothy 3. And yet, in that context, in that environment that he's coming to, we are to be diligent to be found by him in peace. Brothers and sisters, are you in peace today? Is your heart at peace? 1 Peter chapter 4 First uh, Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 12 to 19. When we looked at that section there, tell us that he is coming at a time when there is much suffering and persecution against the church. And yet, he wants the church to be in peace when he comes. If Jesus came today, would you be found by him in a peaceful state of mind? Or are you stressed, fearful, and anxious? Have you already looked at the news this morning? I made sure I didn't. <laughs> so I, I'm here, still ground under my feet. Uh, let's, let's carry on, fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, but if you looked at the news this morning, are you still at peace? He wants us not stressful, not anxious, but peaceful. Bible prophecy, it has been said, I've heard this from others, I don't know who originated this saying, but Bible prophecy is given not to scare us about what is coming, but to prepare us for what is coming. It's not meant to scare you. If your study of Bible prophecy is scaring you, you need to pause and pray, God, cause this to have its intended effect upon me, of assuring me, of giving me confidence of what is coming, to be prepared. And if we truly believe what God tells us in prophecy, and if we trust the Lord to do all that he has promised, then we will have a confident peace in our hearts, while the hearts of unbelievers are failing them for fear. Are you looking forward to the coming day of the Lord with peace in your heart? I, I've talked with, with several people who, they're looking forward to the coming of the day of the Lord, but it's because they are so stressed out, they just want to get out of here. <laughs> and that's not the way the Lord wants us to be dwelling here on earth. Not living in fear of the future. And if we're fearful of the future, it's an indicator that we're not really confident in what God's word says about the future. 
Peter goes on in verse 14 to say that we are to be found without spot and blameless. If you go to the, the next book after 2 Peter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and I know the ladies in our church have been studying this, this book. But verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him. That means remain in him. Draw your life from him. Cling. That when he appears, we may have confidence. Okay, get that. This is what we're looking for. When he appears, that we may have confidence. And he's coming in the midst of trouble that he may find us at peace and in confidence. Here's a clue. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence. This is that peace. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. This passage implies that some will not be ready and will therefore be ashamed in his presence when he comes. But we are made ready for Christ's return by abiding in Christ, meaning we are trusting in him, we are depending upon him for everything that we need. Second Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 3. To abide in Christ means we are confident in him to accomplish in us. And we trust him to accomplish in this world everything that is needed so that when he comes, we may have confidence. We trust God to do it all. And we put no confidence in ourselves or in any other man. That's what it means to abide in him. I am just clinging to him with the dependence, Lord, I depend on you to do it all. I depend on you to provide everything that is needed. I depend on you for all that I need to live life and to be godly. And this confidence comes from trusting God's word. And it gives us great peace when we trust his word and we turn away from it and say, God is in control. He's got it all in his hands. He's working out his plan. And God will make sure that I am ready. How can I know that? Look at Jude. It's the last little book just before Revelation. Jude chapter 24 and 25. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, it's referring to Jesus Christ, he is able to keep you, brothers and sisters, to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He is able to present you faultless when before the presence of his, of his glory. This is at his second coming, when he's coming for us with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So, Lord, how can I be in that state that you want me to be in when you return. It is by me trusting and depending upon you to have me ready when you come. I don't know when you're coming, Lord, but you know when you're coming. And I trust you to have me ready. He who began a good work in you will perfect it or complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so... This peace comes to us when we, here in this life, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the beginning, the one who begins our faith, and the one who brings it to completion. He will get you ready. He will have you ready. And so what's our job? Fix our eyes on him, follow him, trust him. And when that day comes, we will be right where he wants us to be. We will be who he wants us to be. And we will be doing what he wants us doing. It's back to 2 Peter chapter 3, 15. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Uh, this is really a repeat of what he said in verse 9. We looked at this last week when... 
The Lord's patience in waiting to come and bring judgment upon the earth is an expression of his great mercy toward us. In waiting for the last of those who will make up his beloved church, for the last of them to come to faith, then he will come and bring judgment upon the wicked. So why is he waiting? He's waiting for the last of his lost sheep to come in. And so, again, here in verse 15, Peter reminds us that the long-suffering patience of our Lord is resulting in the salvation of souls. He is waiting for the last to come in, who otherwise would be forever lost if he didn't wait. Because when Christ returns, the window of opportunity to escape his wrath will quickly close. 2 Peter 3 goes on, uh, verse 15 again, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul. Now he's giving reference to the apostle Paul. Uh, they, were, they were peers. They ministered together at this last part of, of Peter's life as he's writing this, which was also at the end or near the end of Paul's life. According to the wisdom given to him, given to Paul, was, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Here we find out that uh, the churches that Peter is writing to uh, have also been taught the writings of Paul. They're familiar with his writings. They know it. And um, Paul actually wrote more about the last days than, than Peter did. And, and so Peter gives reference to those letters, and apparently Peter either had, had taught them to, uh, to the churches or he at least knew that they had been taught that. And so he's referring to Paul's writing. But notice that some people, presumably the false teachers, were twisting, meaning they're misquoting or they're taking out of context some of Paul's writing. They're, they're using it in a way that it wasn't meant, getting it to say things that it wasn't meant to say. This is the nature of most false teaching that infiltrates churches. It is teaching that misquotes or misuses the scripture to get it to support the false teacher's own personal views. And notice this characteristic of the false teacher. They don't merely twist one of Paul's doctrines. It's not merely Paul's writing that they misinterpret, that they twist, but they have the same attitude with all of the scriptures. They have no fear of God. They do not submit to the authority of scripture, but instead they put themselves above scripture. We're to, to humble ourselves under Scripture, and, and God's Word is our authority, but these put themselves above it, and they tinker with it, and they manipulate it. They misuse the Bible to serve their own self-indulgent purposes. And in verse 16, the Bible describes these people who twist the Scripture as unstable. Uh, tuck that word away. We're going to be referring to it uh, again. Unstable meaning there is no spiritual strength or consistency in their lives. An unstable person is like this. A stable person, just steady, uh, not the ups and downs, the, 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 the emotion swings, and the, uh, the walking with the Lord, falling, walking, falling. Uh, that's, that is these false teachers. They are unstable, up and down. They don't live by the word of God, but they are hypocritical, saying one thing but doing another because they don't have strong convictions about the Bible. They doubt its accuracy. They doubt its relevance. Have you got any people in mind? Think of some that you may know, false teachers. To be unstable is to easily compromise your moral values. To be unstable is to vacillate and compromise on your doctrine, to compromise your beliefs. You believe one thing until, and you teach one thing until uh, life gets tough, that starts costing, and well, you change your views 
and uh, because you're not willing to pay the price. If you are unstable, you will easily change your views if they're not popular or if they're inconvenient. So rather than submit to the authority of the Bible and follow it even when it is costly, these false teachers twist the Bible's meaning and manipulate it to support what they want to believe, to support the way they want to live, to give them permission to do what they want to do. If they want to divorce their wife and marry another, they can twist the scriptures and allow them to do that. If they want to pursue material wealth, they can twist Jesus' word to allow for that. If they want to accommodate sexual immorality, they can twist the laws to permit it. If they don't want to face judgment for the rejection of God's word, they twist the word to say that there is no judgment, there is no hell. Instead, everyone will be saved. Verse 16 warns that there is a very high price to pay for intentionally twisting and misusing the scriptures to avoid accountability and to lead others to follow in your sin. The consequence is, according to verse 16, that they bring upon themselves destruction, meaning everlasting death and damnation. They bring it upon themselves because the very word that they are twisting is the way of life, the way to life, the way out of condemnation. They twist that and they've lost the way. There is no way. Not everyone who is teaching false doctrine is what the Bible calls a false teacher. And this is something that uh, I, I just want to interject here. Um, you see, I, I see a lot of people being labeled and branded as false teachers who don't fit the biblical description of a false teacher. The label in the Bible, those that the Bible labels as false teacher uh, can also be called false Christians. They're not believers. They're wolves, not true shepherds. They're wolves who are teaching false doctrine. But no Christian is perfect in their doctrine. And, and this is something we need to recognize. Because someone has a flaw in their teaching, that doesn't make them a false teacher, according to the biblical definition. Um, no Christian is perfect in their doctrine. Every genuine, godly teacher, preacher, author is going to have some degree of error in what they teach. Everyone. There is not out there someone whose doctrine is 100% bang on. It may be 100% bang on with your doctrine, but you're in the same error as them. And simply by virtue of us all being fallen, fallible human beings, none of us have perfect doctrine. So be careful. For example, look at all the doctrinal controversy and differences between all the different church denominations. Um, Many denominations are godly people, children of God, following the Lord. I have been part of several denominations over the years of my journey, and I realized that there's people in all different denominations that are stronger in their walk with the Lord than I am. For example, um, well, I'll, I'll skip that. Teachers... <laughs> I know that's a bad thing. <laughs> I'm going to stick to my notes. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not skipping anything that's in my notes. False teachers have a habit of twisting the scriptures. They have a habit. They're not just a scripture that they twist because they don't understand it or, they don't, or they're, they're mistaken, but they've got a habit of twisting the scriptures. There are levels and degrees of false teaching, and not all false doctrine is uh, on the same plane of equal seriousness in terms of the harm it will cause to the followers. Some doctrines are not as critical to our faith and to our spiritual health as others. Also, some false teaching is only a minor distortion or a misunderstanding of a relatively minor doctrine. 
which will be relatively harmless if other people believe what you're saying about it. While other false teaching is a major distortion of numerous important doctrines and therefore is uh, devastating to the faith of anyone that, that would follow that. It is always wrong to ignore false doctrine. It's always wrong to just brush it under, under the carpet as unimportant. We should always strive to discover the truth, to stand for the truth, uh, to contend for the truth, to teach only what is true. But it is also wrong to be contentious, judgmental, and critical of every little inaccuracy in a person's teaching. We're all learning, we're all growing in the truth, and we must be patient with one another's differences of view or differences of interpretation and not just label everybody who sees it differently than you as a false teacher. I, I sure don't want all of you, to, the first time you s hear something that's not right coming from my mouth, to label me as a false teacher. Uh, be sure that you have taken the log out of your own eye before criticizing the splinter in your brother or sister's eye. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul made this confession, which we all should confess. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He's not claiming perfection, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And what should we do when we come across someone whose teaching is off? If possible, I think we should do like this couple did in Acts 18.26. When Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollos, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Let that be our attitude. Apollos wasn't branded a false teacher, but he was corrected in his misunderstanding. As we saw in 2 Peter chapter 2, some of the main characteristics of a false teacher are ungodliness in their personal lives, resulting in ungodliness in the lives of their followers. And I'm convinced that some of those who are often labeled as false teachers are genuine brothers and sisters in Christ who have some false teaching, but for the most part, they are really solid in what they teach, and they are living godly, Christ-honoring lives. And those who follow their, te their leadership are being built up and are thriving in their own walk with the Lord because of that leader's ministry. Such a person is not who Peter is talking about when he's talking about the false teachers. I, I would throw out an example. One, um, I, I just use this because a very well-known name, highly respected elderly man, uh, John MacArthur. I, I highly respect his ministry and his teaching and I benefit much from it. He has an area of his doctrine that I would say is false doctrine. I don't agree with that, but that's, that's a difference that we don't agree on. I don't label him as a false teacher. And, and we could identify others. A godly man, as for everything that I see and know of him, who has helped and benefit the spiritual lives of many people. That's, and so we, we just need to be careful in that area. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. You, therefore, beloved... Since you know this beforehand, meaning since you have been warned by God's word about these false teachers in advance, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Jesus repeatedly gave this warning in the context of teaching about the last days. He repeatedly would say, take heed. Watch out, be on your guard, stay alert that no one deceives you. And so Peter is repeating that to the church and particularly as he's writing to uh, the churches that will be going through the last days, he is cautioning them, beware, stay on your alert, um, constantly wary of these false teachers and their false doctrine, guarding yourself because it's going to increase as the last days come. 
False teaching is often deceptively appealing. The risk of falling for it is real. Uh, there have been strong believers who have been led astray by false teachers. As we have seen, some of the largest and fastest growing ministries in the world are being led by false teachers. Notice what 2 Peter 3.17 says can happen if you embrace the scripture-twisting error of the false teachers. It says, beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. So there's two things that, that Peter is identifying here that you are at risk of experiencing if you embrace the false teaching. One, you risk falling from your own steadfastness. And two, you risk being led away. So we'll look at each of these individually. First of all, you risk falling from your own steadfastness or from losing, you risk losing your stability. This is not saying that you risk losing your salvation. That's not what Peter is saying. But you risk losing your stability in life. Peter is writing to churches whose members have been firmly established upon the teaching of God's word. You're, you're stable, guys. You're, there's stability in your life. There's steadfastness in your life. But you embrace some of this false teaching, you risk losing that. They are steady, consistent followers of Jesus whose eyes are fixed on him, fixed on the truth of his word. Steadfastness or stability is the opposite of, of these false teachers. The false teachers, unstable, um, the, these Christians that Peter is writing to, you're steadfast, you're stable. There's consistency in you. It comes from putting your faith in all of God's word, every word of it, so that you know God, you know his voice, you can pick his voice out in the midst of the storm, and you apply God's word, which you trust, to every situation, to every decision. You always have that compass uh, that you trust in, that you depend on, that questions arise, circumstances arise, you can look to his word and you trust it. But if you look to his word and you think, well, maybe it means this, or maybe it means that. That's the, the scripture twisting. And you lose that confidence that I'm not really sure what God's word, it says this, but the teacher said it really means that. And and you lose your stability. And, but we need to be able to apply God's word to every situation, every decision that has to be made. Look to the scripture. What does the word of God say? How does he guide? How does he direct us? And if you embrace the teaching of false teachers, you risk being filled with doubts and questions about spiritual truths that you should have strong convictions on. There will be inconsistencies and contradictions between your beliefs and your actions. You will become unable to discern God's leading. You will question his word, especially in times of crisis like we're facing in the world today when there are, is a huge spiritual storm brewing around us. You don't want to be unsure of God's word. Contrary to what the Lord is looking for in us, you will have no peace about the future if you are being led astray by false teachers. But you will be dreading what is going to happen next. Every new crisis will cause new panic and you won't know who you can trust. You won't know who you can believe, who you can listen to. You'll be filled with confusion and uncertainty. And that's the way we often begin feeling when we start spending too much time in the news. And then you pick up God's word and, and start spending time in his word, meditating on his word. And, and you just feel that peace and that confidence as he reveals to you scriptures that are helpful, scriptures that are encouraging, scriptures that, that build your, your faith and confidence in him. Turn with me to James uh, it's just, if you're in Peter, to the left, just before 1 Peter, James chapter 1. Look at verse 6, where we have described for us a loss of steadfastness, and here's how it describes it. He who doubts 
is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That's the storm in life coming against you. If you're doubting God's word, you're going to be tossed by the waves, by the storm. Verse 7, for let not that man, the one who doubts God's word, suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So the second risk that Peter identifies if you follow false teachers and their false teaching is that you risk being led, uh, led away with the error of the wicked. Verse 17, being led away. What does it mean to be led away? Led away from what? The word is a, a picture, a word picture of uh, a wolf, false teacher, disguised as a shepherd, leading a sheep away from the rest of the flock. Or a predator with a, a bag of candy in his hand, leading an unsuspecting child away from the playground towards a waiting car. That's the word picture that's being presented. You follow this false teaching, false teachers, you're going to be led away. They risk being led away from the protection and guidance of the truth of God's word. And you risk being led away from fellowship with God, who can only be worshipped in truth. But they also risk being led away from fellowship with solid believers, as those, uh, and, and we've all known people like this, who have embraced false doctrine, begun following a false teacher. They usually leave their church either to join another group that believes the same false teaching that, that they've been deceived into or to just wander alone following their false teacher online, but part of no group. They've been led away from a healthy church. They've been led away from community into an unhealthy community. They have been led away from watchful, Bible-believing shepherds who watch over their well-being and feed them the word of God. And instead, they come under the care of wolves in sheep's clothing who feed them twisted scriptures. No church is perfect. In fact, a healthy church is going to be filled constantly with, a, a, with imperfect people, immature people, new believers, uh, babies in the, in the faith. But no church is perfect. But there is safety in belonging to a body of Bible-believing followers of Jesus Christ who encourage one another in the faith, who together watch out for one another and warn one another of deception and spiritual dangers. There's safety in that. And that's where God has put us. But false teachers lead you out of that environment. And then you're doubly at risk. We grow and thrive best when we are in a healthy family where there is protection, where there is provision, where there is love. The church is God's family where the members watch out for each other, provide for each other's needs, nourish one another, build one another up in the faith. It's dangerous to be led away from the truth and it's dangerous to be led away from the body of Christ for the Bible warns us that this risk of false teachers is going to increase in the last days. And so, uh, again, I, I recommend if you're able, come out tonight and uh, we'll take a look at, at what um, are some of the things that are being taught out there that we need to be aware of and watching for. Verse 18, last verse of 2 Peter. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We are safeguarded from being deceived by false teachers. And we will have peace and confidence in our hearts in these last days. And whenever Christ comes, sooner or later, he will find us in peace 
as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is why we come together. That is why we encourage the, the feeding yourself, nourishing your, your spirit and soul on the word of God in your own at home. And when we come together, uh, it is to build up and to, to nourish that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To grow in the grace is to grow in that dependence upon him for everything. I rely on him. I trust in him for everything. And he supplies all that I need. That's growing in the grace of him. And we grow in the knowledge of Jesus by learning to trust all that he says to us through his word and cling to it. And much of this growing in grace and knowledge is cultivated and encouraged through our interaction with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, being part of the church family. Beware of those who would lead you away. From, from fellowship with God, from trusting in his word, from, from fellowship with the body of Christ. And that risk and that danger is going to increase as we move forward uh, into these last days. So Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can read your word and not walk away from it burdened and loaded down, viewing this as a huge homework assignment that we've been given. But Lord, we can look at your word and recognize these are the promises of the God who has come to dwell within us as our source of life and godliness. And Lord, you do not want us on our own trying to generate these characteristics and qualities and, and peacefulness. But Lord, these are the fruit that you produce in us as we rely on you, trust in you, cling to you, feed on you, feed on your word. I pray for your church, Lord, and ask that, that we would be ones whose confidence is in you, not in our ability to do what you want us to do, but in your ability to complete the work you've begun in us and to conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ and to make us ready for your return. Lord, we trust you. And I pray, Father, that you would cause to settle upon each of our hearts and minds this week the peace of God and that it would guard our hearts and guard our minds in Christ Jesus. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill our mouths not with words of stress or anger, of fearfulness, but Lord, fill our mouths with words of grace, words of hope, words of good news to a lost world that is increasingly stressed and fearful. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the way to the Father. You are the way to abundant life. You are the way to peace in the midst of the storm. And we thank you that we have you, Jesus. Cause us to cling to you, to trust in you with all our hearts. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I also pray if there be any here who do not have this relationship with you, that you would cause faith to arise in their hearts, that you would cause them to desire you and to desire to walk in the light of your truth and your word. Heavenly Father, I pray for their salvation. And I pray that you would cause us as a church to be sensitive to the needs of all around us here in this place and as we go out, Father, that we would be your ambassadors, that we would uh, be ready with an answer to those who ask us the reason for the hope that we have. And it's also in the name of Jesus I ask this. Amen. Amen. Amen.